Today, I have with me Robert Malky, author of the book, This is My Lemonade. Actually, I have the book right here in front uh, with me. <laughs> um, it's an adoption story. Uh, he's joining us from California. How are you? I am doing great. Thank you for having me on your show. I appreciate it. So, uh, yeah, to, uh, before we get into, uh, you know, details of your wonderful book, um, if you can give us a brief introduction about yourself. Okay. Um, I am 55 years old. I live in the Portland, Oregon area. I was born in a small town called Silverton. It was a small logging town, very historical. It is now an, an arts and cultural center. I was raised in a rural area in Oregon, so I grew up in a very Norman Rockwell environment where my family was always together every night. My dad was a forklift driver, my mom was a homemaker, and she baked bread and cookies and cakes, and she canned vegetables and fruits, and she knitted and sewed and everything. They were, very, they were Depression era children, and they went through the war, so they knew how to stretch a dollar. We were middle income, so we had a very good life. I am a graduate of Oregon State University. I have a Bachelor of Science in Sociology with a minor in Geography. I have spent most of my life in Oregon. I did spend eight years in Southern California back in the 80s, and I'm down here now with a friend, uh, helping her through a difficult time, and I thought that while I was down here, I would try to promote my book uh, with the movie studios. So that's... So, um how did you actually, um, you know, get into writing? Because from your background, it was, you know, nothing related to writing or being an author. Um, so can you share about how you got into writing this book? Well, I wrote in high school. I had a very good teacher who tapped into my ability to write. And from there, it kind of blossomed. I was the editor of our high school newspaper. I wrote for the uh, the the yearbook. Uh, I took writing and journalism in college, but I didn't pursue it as a career because it didn't interest me being a journalist. I wanted to do something a little more creative, and when I got out of college, the economy was very bad in Oregon, so I had to take whatever job came along, and I put writing on the side. It wasn't until about, oh, four years ago that I started writing this book. It took me two and a half years to write it, and then another two years to have it edited and have it formatted and start promoting it. Uh, so that's pretty much where uh, what got me back into writing. I've always missed it. In the past, I've done writing on the side. I've written a couple of technical um, publications. I've done writing and editing for some publications in Oregon just to kind of keep my feet wet and keep my skills somewhat sharpened. Uh, but this book was a total leap of faith, just jumping right in with both feet uh, to start my uh, start my writing again and try to pursue it as a career if possible um, so I have read your book I love it uh, like I said but um, you know in your own words um, you know can you share moments with your um, with your uh, ad with your mother um, and when she was sharing about your biological mother because I don't think you have really detailed out you have detailed out, uh, you know, I think the uh, chronological order, and I did understand, um, but I, I just wanted to know more about, you know, what you felt um, when, when, you're, when you heard about your biological mother. I was in college, I was a freshman in college, and I had come home uh, Christmas break from college, and I walked up the steps to my house, and um, my parents' house, and my mom, uh, came up to me when I got in the house and just out of the blue dropped this bombshell on me and said, did you know you have a brother and a father in British Columbia? 
and I did not know this. I only knew that I had been adopted. They told me when I was a child, but I never really thought anything about it. I just kind of pushed it to the side after initially finding out, and then all of a sudden to have this information thrown at me with no forewarning was very shocking. And I was literally speechless. And from there, she just went on to tell me all of the details of my adoption about how my mother had come to Oregon from British Columbia. This is my biological mother. She was unmarried. She was pregnant. And she stayed with my parents so I could be born an American citizen. She, um, my parents put, uh, put up all the money for my adoption. They paid her medical bills. They paid her hospital bills. They paid her doctor bills. They paid for all medications. They paid for everything. So they were generations ahead of their time. That's very common in America now where a family will take in a pregnant, unmarried woman, pay for all of the expenses with the understanding that the family will then adopt the, the child. So this was a revelation to me because I had no knowledge of my background. My parents had never told me anything. And now all of a sudden, all this was being laid at my feet along with a letter from my biological mother that had been written back when I was a baby and a picture of my biological mother and father. So hearing this as only as an 18-year-old was very shocking and I was stunned to the core. That was all I could think about for weeks and weeks and weeks. And it was, it was exhilarating because prior to this revelation, I had done some snooping through my parents' private papers to find my adoption decree. Uh, I said that I had never been terribly interested, and for the most part I wasn't, but one day my curiosity got the better of me, and I went and did some snooping when nobody was in the house. And I actually found my adoption papers with my mother's name on it, but I never told anybody. I never told my parents. They went to their graves not knowing this. But I already had a little bit of information, but then uh, four months later, everything was given to me in one lump sum almost. And it jarred me to my core, but it excited me because all of a sudden the pace of finding information had increased exponentially. And with my initial search of just my adoption records, I suddenly had all this information in front of me about my past and about my ethnicity and the circumstances surrounding my adoption. So everything was being pieced together for my life and my identity very, very quickly. So, um, so I received all this information and it was shocking. I, I kept most of it to myself and I began to contemplate this journey that I was about to take, but I didn't contemplate it too much because I was so excited to have a brother. I had always wanted a brother as a child and, now, and I never had one, and now all of a sudden I did have one. And I found out he was three years younger than I was. Um, in my adoptive family, all I had, the only sibling I had was a, a sister who was nine years older than I am. And so there was a bit of a gulf there because one, she was a woman, two, there was nine years difference, and three, we were of different genetic quality, if you will, different people, um, different personalities and everything. And now I found out I had a full-blooded brother and I was thrilled by that and excited by that, and I couldn't wait to meet him. Right. So um, I did see, you know, like as I was reading, that you took a lot of interest in um, trying to find out and be uh, together with your biological family. And I kind of wondered um, how your uh, mother had taken that. Um, I'm a mother of two kids, and I. You know, I just got to thinking that there should be or there must be certain amount of um, jealousy or insecurity. Um, did, did you feel that? Was, was that there? How, it just was, wanted to when I made the, uh, started this search, I knew in my heart that it was going to be difficult for my parents. My parents uh, were very loving, very kind, very sensitive people, and I knew it would be difficult for them for me to make this journey because there would be this other identity, this other family there that would have a strong pull emotionally for me. My birth mother had already passed away so I never got a chance to meet her. So my mom was protected somewhat from having anybody competing for her affections as a mother figure. However, my father, my adoptive dad, um, had a competitor and that was my biological father. So I tried very hard to temper my enthusiasm when I met my family and as I developed a relationship from them because I didn't want my parents to feel like they were being left out 
or being rejected because that was not the case. So I tried very hard to, um, I would share with them what had happened in British Columbia when I went to meet my family and every t time I took a trip, but I was very cautious in my enthusiasm so that they wouldn't be hurt and wouldn't be jealous. But the problem, and I, and I realized that even at a young age, at the age of 18, 19, but the problem is when an adoptee meets his biological family, the adoptive family, I think, can't help but be, feel like they're left out or set to, pushed to the side. And no matter how hard you try, those feelings, I think, are going to be there because this is such a unique relationship. You are the adoptive family is suddenly sharing their child with the biological family, which has a tremendous emotional pull. So no matter how hard you try, there's going to be feelings that will be trampled upon. And as hard as I tried, my mom told me several years later that they did feel kind of hurt or very hurt over what was happening. But my mom was a very strong, devoutly Christian woman, and she was forced to accommodate this and rely on her faith and rely on our, our relationship so that later on as things mellowed out with me and my biological family, she began to realize that the love I had for them was still there. It was intact. It was never going away. And she could relax knowing that even though I had a relationship with my biological family and it was growing, that she was still, or my adoptive family was still primary in my life. Right. So how did you... Um you know, cope up with the fact that you knew you were adopted, um, but how did you cope up with the fact that, you know, you couldn't really meet your uh, biological mother in person? When I went to British Columbia, which is where my biological family lived, uh, and I found out that my mother had passed away for probably three or four years, I was obsessed with her. I couldn't stop thinking about her. I, at one point in British Columbia, I decided to search for her grave, and I didn't tell anybody I was looking because when I met them, when I met my family, my mother had only been dead for six years, and she had been ill for a long time, and her death was very jarring for the entire family, especially for my brother, who was only 10 when he lost her, and so I, I felt uncomfortable asking them for the location of her grave because everybody was still so broken up about it and, and hurting so much, so I decided to just look. And on, I just started looking. I went to a gas station. I knew she lived in the area, so I went to a local gas station. I said, is there a, a cemetery nearby? And they said, yes. I went to it. I found the caretaker. I asked him for my mother's name, and he found it. So everything fell into place, just like finding my family fell into place. And I would go there every trip to British Columbia. I would visit her grave. I would sit there and look at her grave. I would clean it off of moss and leaves. I would always leave flowers. I would always leave mums because I thought those were appropriate. And I would talk to her. It was the closest physical approximation I would ever have with her. And I would, you know, just, just I would speak rhetorically like, why did you have to die? Why couldn't you live? I wanted, I wish I could have met you. I wish I could have known you. I would pray to God and ask him, to give me an hour with her, because I thought, well, God can do anything. Why won't he do this for me? Why did she have to go? And that's what went through my mind, because it was like I lost her a second time. You know, she gave me away. She did what she thought right. was best. And then I find out that she died, and I will never have the chance to see her. And that obsessed me for a long time. Eventually, I worked it through. But then later in life, the last few years, it began to haunt me some more because I found out that after I was born she returned to British Columbia and no mention was made of my existence and I felt as though I had been aborted I just felt tossed away um, abandoned my female friend said to me uh, Bob a woman will never forget her child especially her firstborn and they said she thought of you every day of her life she probably prayed for you she remembered you on your birthday and they said, don't ever discount that because I can tell you that it's true. And when I looked at the, the facts that I had, the evidence I had, these letters asking for pictures of me, and knowing that she came to visit me, I began to realize that she did care for me. And so now I am at peace with her. Um, I would give anything if I could just, if I could just see her.
Right. So, you know, after you, at that point of time, you know, when she gave you up, she was a single woman, um, she was not married yet. Um, but later, when you found out that um, she did get married to your uh, biological father, um, and, you know, she did have a family of her own with your younger brother. Um, so do you think, of course, you know, um, I don't know if you had done any research. Um, I just wondered, like, if your biological mother might have had any moments of regret um, in giving you up. I don't know if she did or not. I don't think she did. I think that she did the, what she felt was best at the time because she was not married, and this was 1958-59, and at that time to be single and pregnant was socially unacceptable. I don't know if my um, analysis in reading a book was right, but I just wanted to ask you um, to share a little bit about your relation with both your father and why you felt like you didn't have a relation with them. Well, my adoptive father was a very insecure man. He was very self-doubting. There were ten kids in his family, and my grandfather chose him to be the whipping boy. He was the one that got beaten all the time. So because of that, he became very insecure. My mom told me that when my birth mother, my birth mother's name was Gwen, so I'll refer to her as Gwen so that it makes it easier for your listeners to determine who I'm talking about. Okay. My mom who raised me, I call mom because she was my mom. She's the one that took care of me. So when Gwen was pregnant with me, my mom told me that my dad was fearful that I would be born a boy. And of course, this was before amniocentesis and DNA and all of that, so they didn't know what the child was going to be. He was fearful I would be a boy because he didn't feel he would be able to be a proper father figure for me. He was so self-doubting. And so rather than try and, make, and, and then make mistakes and learn as he went along, he didn't try. And so, as a result, I had no relationship with him as I grew, as I got older. And then, as I got into school, I was an, an exceptional student. I was um, border, uh, borderline, I guess what you would call gifted, is what the term they would use today, mm -hmm. because they, they were tracking us in school, and they moved me and a bunch of other kids into a certain class, and they tracked us for several years. This was in the 60s. And, beca okay. and because of that, he was intimidated, because he had this son, and all of a sudden it turns out his, that his son is bright, and my father only had an edu eighth grade education, so that exacerbated his feelings of self-doubt. And so I never had a relationship with him. And as I became a, a teenager, I started dating, I got a car, I got a job, I went to college, and I just kind of left him behind. That was all I knew. And then as, uh, when I was a teenager, there was this horrendous experience that, that occurred in my family, which I will not give details on. Somebody will have to, you'll have to read the book to find out. But right. th that in increased the gulf between us. When I found out I had my biological father, I was encouraged because I thought maybe I will be able to have the father-son relationship that I never had. And it turned out that my biological father still uh, harbored a lot of grief from my adoption because he wanted to keep his family intact. And he was, in his attempts, he was incarcerated for it and he was convicted and thrown into prison or into jail. And he still had that grief and that anger, and he projected that onto me because I was a convenient scapegoat. Every time he saw me, he was reminded of this negative situation that occurred to him. And so he abused me emotionally and ver verbally and spiritually for 30 years. And I kept going back because I wanted that father-son dynamic so bad. And I put myself at risk, and I continued to do so for 30 years. So what was missing, like what did you dream of, you know, in getting um, in your relation with, with, with the father? So what is that was missing in your life that you, you know, kept on, I guess? I guess that mentoring that occurs between a father and a son, because as a father, uh, well, as a son, the father is the primary male figure in your life, and he is the one that is supposed to teach you to become a man and teach you ethics and all of these things that a mother can teach too, but he is the direct uh, male descendant for you. So he is there to, uh, to guide you into manhood. So did you ever, you know, speak about this to your uh, adopted father? 
Never. I never told my parents what was going on. Yeah, it was more like an internal conflict it looked like when I read your book. It was it was all in your head and, you know, yeah, it was, it was what I wanted, um, and I didn't get it. I didn't tell my parents because they would have been devastated. They would have been furious, and they would have pressured me not to associate with my biological family. And I didn't want to put them through all that, so I internalized it and kept it to myself without, uh, without sharing it with them because I, I wanted to protect them from the hurt. There are two things I wanted to know. One is... Um you know, in the process of writing and you pouring out your heart out, did it heal you, you know, to a certain um, extent um, in pouring out what was in your head and your heart? And the second thing was, um, because you are talking about real people, real incidents, and, you know, you did speak about bad things, good things, um, did you have any conflict in, you know, thinking that, oh, maybe I should not write this um, to protect the privacy, or uh, I just, you know, kind of wondered about that. Uh, okay, to answer the first question, uh, um, was, it, was it therapeutic for me? Yes, it was very therapeutic. I used to watch people on TV who would write books, celebrities would write books about their lives, and I would think, how self-important is that? And they would talk about how therapeutic it was, but it's completely true. When you see these words in print, for me anyway, all of a sudden, they didn't have, th these situations didn't have any dominion over me anymore. But that's me. Uh, it was very cathartic for me to get this out, even though I had discussed my problems with some friends, never with my family, but with some trusted friends. But to see everything written down in words was, was, was very shocking. And I would read and reread and reread the book. I have re read it probably four dozen times, literally. And I've done that in order to help myself heal by learning more about everybody involved. My biological parents, my biological family, my adoptive family, and me, how I responded to things. It was very therapeutic. It was very cathartic. The first iteration of the book was very angry. Uh, there was, it was just full of anger. I had a couple of friends read it, and they all came back and said, this is too angry, you, you come across as a jerk. <laughs> and so I reread it through fresh eyes, based on what they had told me, and they were right. I was very angry, and I came across as just a total jerk, and I thought, I can't write this, because people are going to think I'm this uh, vicious, cruel person. So I had to tone it down, and most of the anger was directed towards my... Uh, biological father, so I had to demonize him less and humanize him more, so, <laughs> if that makes sense. So I took out a lot of negative things and I added more positive things because just because somebody is mean and vindictive and cruel does not mean they don't have good points. And I had to show people that he did have good points and I didn't want them right. to think that he was Satan because he was not. There were times when I hated my biological father. There were times when I couldn't stand him and I would distance myself. Um, as for people being impacted by the book, my, uh, the matriarchs and patriarchs of my family are all deceased now. So the person who was impacted the most so far has been my biological brother. When he read the first iteration of this book, he was furious and he lashed out at Oh, he was, he was absolutely <laughs> furious. He sent me a huge text message that went on for page after page and just with all this vitriol, he was so angry. And I, it didn't bother me because he has a different viewpoint of my father than I do. He was the child that my father raised. He was the golden child who um, did everything my father did. I came into the picture, I upset the apple cart, and I brought all of this negative energy into the family. So that's why I was trashed and treated like I was less than nothing. So naturally, my brother, who was worshipped, has a, an elevated view of my father, where I had a, a more subterranean view of him because of the way he treated me. But my, fa my brother is a very intelligent, very intelligent man, very sophisticated man. He's traveled the world. He lives in Moscow, Russia right now. And...
it didn't take him long. It took him maybe a week or two before he came back and he said, you need to, you need to publish this book, Bob. He, sa he said, you did a good job. Because it took, he just had to work it through himself and understand that this was my story and this is what I thought. I wasn't stating these things as fact. I was just saying this is my experience and this is my opinion based on my experiences. And he realized that and now he's probably my biggest champion. Your experience, do you have any, you know, message or um, advice to people who are going through such relation? Um, I don't know, to make, to make an effort while we are living? Well, uh, the, one of the biggest ones as, as an overall message or something I think would be to, to uh, what I just mentioned, to step back and look and see if your dreams are already met and they're there and embrace them because I think things come to us the way we need them, not the way we want them. And we need to revel in that and be open to that and not be so arrogant that we want things the way we want them. Uh, I, I always wondered, uh, you know, when you wrote the book, how did you write? Did you write in a book, typewriter, computer? I wrote at my laptop. It was the easiest way because it's easy to make uh, mistakes and then correct them and then go back later and edit things around, move things around. So that's what I used was my laptop. And okay. for me, once I started writing, I couldn't stop. I was going so fast my fingers couldn't keep up with my, the thoughts in my mind. And I wrote it the way, uh, when you read the book, and the book is called This Is My Lemonade, An Adoption Story, the way you read it is the exact way I wrote it. I didn't write the middle, didn't write the ending or anything like that. I wrote it in chronological order. So the way you read I it is you. the way it was written. I see. So how long did you take to write this book? Two and a half years. Two and a half years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Two and a half years of my life. Wow. So you just like wrote every day or it was like... Not necessarily every day. Sometimes I was, as I said, I was so motivated I just couldn't stop writing. And then there were other times when it, it was very, as I said, it was very cathartic, but there were times when it took so much out of me that I just didn't want to look at it. And I wouldn't mm -hmm. write for several weeks because it was so hard. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of ugliness in there. There's a lot of beauty and a lot of blessings, but there's a lot of ugliness in there. Right, and it, it was almost like you are reliving it again when you are writing it. Yeah, I, I, I truly was. And some of the things I wrote in there are so ugly, but I thought to myself, and I would stop before I would write it, and I would say, should I put this in here? And then I thought to myself, I have to, because if I'm going to write this, I have to be honest. I have to be... Right. And I have to be... No. Because people don't want something that's dishonest, and they can see right through that. No, and I felt, yeah, I felt the honesty in that... Um, which is why I was like, oh my God, you know, he's writing about real events and how did it real, really impact, you know, the real people? Because, like you said, it's not only about, you know, good, good stuff that you're writing. You're writing about, like, what you felt and what actually happened. So, yeah, we, we uh, I think uh, I did read a lot of reviews about your book and I think many of your uh, readers did feel that honesty and that kind of uh, pull the reader to, you know, read more. That's right, and, and that's, I wanted people, like I said, to feel the honesty and, and kind of maybe feel that, you know, they're not alone in the dysfunction and problems in their family. I did not write the book with any moral in mind, any moral to the story. I wanted people to read it and get whatever they get out of it and hopefully maybe get something they weren't expecting. And I've had right. people write to me and tell me that they were just shocked at, what, at some of the realizations they came to in their life, and that's probably one of the greatest compliments that I can get when somebody reads the book and they say I was not expecting this and I'm reevaluating that makes me feel great that really makes me feel right. great so what do you what do you do outside of you know writing and traveling we have heard a little bit well traveling is my biggest passion right now <laughs> as you can tell yeah I, I do I spend I have a, I live kind of a quiet life just even though it sounds like it's pretty exotic and everything when I'm at home I spend time with my friends I enjoy fine dining, cuisine. Oregon has a magnificent wine country, so we go wine tasting quite a bit. And I lift weights, I play racquetball, I enjoy that type of thing. So um, my, ex my life now is more around experiences, uh, just being with the people I love and uh, in enjoying and savoring that time, doing things with All right, so that's good. Thank you so much for your time today. Do you have anything I have missed, uh, but you know, you wanted to mention in our show? 
Uh, maybe not, just other than that, my book is called This Is My Lemonade, An Adoption Story. You can click on to www.thisismylemonade.com and read a little bit about the book, the prologue in the first chapter. There's a video of me singing with my Italian cousins. Uh, it's available on Kindle, and it's available. Um, you can also purchase it through Amazon.com. If anybody does buy it, I really covet your responses and your thoughts. I would love to know what people think. It's very encouraging for me, and I want to know if it's you know good or bad. Um, I really my my intent for writing this book initially was to reach out to the adoption community for because of my story is kind of unique and it is uh, as I said a lifelong journey for an adult adoptee. But then um, I realized what's happened is it's women who have responded mostly to this book, whether they've adopted or not. And it, because women are the ones who get pregnant, obviously. Women are the ones right. who give up a child. And they have responded to this book like you would not believe. And it's been very gratifying. But I think it's for anybody who, um, want, first of all, wants a good read. And I hope, as I said, that people who read it are able to find something about it, find something in it for them. I really hope it blesses people. Yeah, thank you. And here I am holding this very book. This is my lemonade. I have read it. It's good. It's a good read. Um, it is available in Amazon.com and also for our listener, we'll be giving out some complimentary copy. I already have people requesting from Manipur to get it, uh, you know, when I go home. Uh, so yes, so thank you. Thank you so much for uh, your time today and sharing your wonderful